What's that? Yeah. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. That's okay. You're going to be fine. Yep. Okay, welcome back, welcome back to me, I'm sorry I was not here with you on Thursday, but um, it looks like you all survived just fine without me for the midterm, um, if you have checked your email in the last hour or two, you have gotten an email that lists all the scores for the midterm um, and what those scores roughly mean. So um, there were 47 questions on the midterm. The average score was a 39.5, um, which translates to 84% correct. Um, a number of you, a small number, but a number of you got perfect scores. Four of you got perfect scores. Uh, several other people got 46 out of 47. And so the magic number for interpreting your score, if you did not get a 46 or 47, is 46.4. That is the average of the top 10 scores. And that's what sets the bar against which I multiply 90%, 80%, 70%, and so on. Now, of course, this is all just sort of pretend at this point because really the only time I do that where it counts for me is at the end of the quarter after I get a number that combines all of your points and scores. Okay? But I know that everyone wants to know how to interpret what they've gotten so far. And so in that I gave you approximately, if this was the only thing that counted towards your grades and I had to give you a grade based only on this exam, Okay, a 42 puts you in the A range. That means A minus A, A plus. That's the A range. 42 puts you in the A range. 37 in the B range. That's B minus B, B plus. Um, 32 puts you in the C range. And 28 puts you in the D range. Um, so... Um, I am not today going to go over uh, the answers to any of the specific questions for a couple of reasons. 
uh, the most important of which is that there are still three people who haven't taken the exam. Um, so going over the hardest questions that the most people got wrong in here uh, would not be exactly fair. Uh, the way the procedure works, if you think that you might have had your exam misgraded, or if you think that there was a question that wasn't fair, uh, that there was some answer that really was right, presumably the one you put and got marked wrong, uh, there's sort of a, a two-step procedure that's involved. The first thing you should do is go to your TA's office hours in the coming week. So your TA's um, today are getting, they have copies of the exams, and they have a sheet that lists what every single person in the class put for every single answer. Okay, so they have a sheet where they can look you up by ID number and say, these are the five you got wrong, here's the answer you put, and then the right answer was this. So you can look at that, cross-reference them, and talk with your TA about uh, the ones that were marked wrong. So if you think that we erred in terms of uh, deciding what the correct answer was, okay, discuss it with your TA. I'm pretty confident on this exam that we don't have uh, any items where we're going to need to accept other uh, answers. We, we went to some length to make sure that that wouldn't be the case, but it does happen from time to time, and I'm fine with that if that does happen. Uh, but talk about that with your TA, and hopefully uh, you'll be satisfied from that conversation. If not, the next step is to come see me, okay? And then we can talk about it. Um, and I have been convinced by students before to accept another answer but it is a rare, relatively rare event. Uh, the other thing that might happen is that you might think that something was mismarked on your exam itself, like you had a stray pencil mark. Okay? That might have made it look like you answered something that you would not have wanted to have answered. I will be keeping all of the scantrons. Okay? So after you go and meet with your TA to go over the exam itself, if you are looking at an answer going, I never would have put that answer, that might mean that the Scantron has a mismarking, then you should come see me. Okay, so first step, go see your TAs in the next week. If there are remaining issues, come see me next week during office hours. This Wednesday is Veterans Day. There will not be office hours um, for me this Wednesday. Uh, let's see, any questions about sort of those midterm related issues at this point? If you're in the class right now and you haven't taken the exam yet, can you raise your hand? Okay, yeah. So that might be an issue also. Is it might just be that the three people, well, one of them I know, two of them are taking an exam on Thursday, but there's two others who I don't know who they are. It's difficult for me to figure out. My guess is those folks are probably just dropping the class, and we'll know that in a week. Once that's been done, I will take a few minutes to go over the three or four questions that fewer than half of the people in the class got right. I do like to go through those so people get a clear understanding, but I don't want to do that yet until I know that everyone who's taking the exam has taken it. Uh, the one other thing I want to discuss with you uh, is attendance. Okay. Uh, so I was thinking about taking attendance now because we're at the beginning of the second half, but I was also thinking about just dropping the attendance requirement. <laughs> but you know, your enthusiasm to that response actually makes me nervous about dropping the attendance requirement. Um, Okay, I'm going to take two votes here, two different votes. First vote, how many of you want me to drop that and put those two points into your section grade, which is where they've always been before? Raise your hands if you want the two percentage points. Okay, so in the past, it's always been 40, 40, 20. 40 midterm, 40 final, 20% on section. This year, it's 40, 40, 18, and 2. So what I'm suggesting is those 2% would go into your section grade. Raise your hands 
if you would want the 2% to go into your section grade rather than to be something that's taken by attendance. Okay. How many of you would prefer to keep attendance being where you get those two points? Interesting. And now, if you're not here right now and you want to vote, sorry. Okay. Well, all right. Then I don't need to ask the second question. We're good. Okay. So any other procedural issues before we get back to business? And by getting back to business, I mean closing your eyes. What's that? I am not taking attendance today. I only threatened to take attendance today. That's what I just said. You can go listen to the video. Oh, right. So if you did not receive an email with your grade, that probably means the registrar or psychology has the wrong email address for you. Um, I can't control that, but I did post it also to the, the Blackboard website. So the, the grades are there as well in the same area that I post all the lectures uh, as PowerPoint slides. Okay. So I would like you all to close your eyes temporarily. And what I would like you to think about is the people that you're friends with okay, and how good of a friend are you to those people that you're friends with. Okay, so I want you to think about how good of a friend you are to your friends. Okay, so you should sort of have that in mind now. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I want you to raise your hand if what I ask you is true, and then keep your hand up until I say something that isn't true for you. The videotape is on me. You are not in the videotape. Close your eyes. Cheaters. Okay. Everyone's got their eyes closed. You're thinking about how good of a friend you are to your friends. And very simple question, okay. are you a better friend to your friends than at least 10% of random people out in the world? And let me, let me reparse that for you. Don't, don't raise your hands yet. What I'm asking is, do you think you're a better friend compared to how much other people you, you know, random people out there are good friends to their friends? So are you at least as good a friend to your friends as 10% of the people in the world? Raise your hands if you're at least as good as 10%. Okay, and if you don't have your hand up right now, I am tempted to come around and tickle you. Because <laughs> your eyes are closed. Okay, so you better get your hands up if you think you're at least as good a friend to your friends as all but 10 or at least 10% of the population. Okay, now keep your hands up. Now, are you as good a friend to your friends as 20% of the population? If that is also true of you, keep your hands up. Okay, are you at least as good a friend to your friend as 30% of the population? Okay, keep your hands up. 40%. Keep your hands up. 50%. Keep your hands up, keep them up, keep them up, and keep them up while you are opening your eyes. Keep your hands up, open your eyes, look around. Hold on, we'll get back to you. Okay, keep your hands up now. So everyone who has their hands up thinks they're at least as good a friend to their friends as 50% of other people are to their friends. Let's go a little further. How many keep their hands up for 60%? Oh, it's amazing. As soon as you open your eyes and look around, people start dropping them. Okay, so you can put them all down. Okay, so what I can tell you is, of people who ever put their hands up, because some of you never put your hands up, okay? Uh, but for those of you who put your hands up, I would say 95% of you left your hands up through 50%. Okay, now, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not really a statistician either, although I use statistics in what I do. 
But what I can tell you is it's impossible for 95% of you to be better friends to your friends than 50% of other people. Okay? The question was, are you a better friend to your friends than other people are to their friends? Okay, so how good of a friend do you think you are to your friends? No, 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 no I, don't care, I don't care what you thought. I'm asking you now, I'm asking you now, what percentage of people do you think you're a better friend to than other people are? What percentage do you think you're better? So like, you're so good of a friend to your friends, what percentage of people do you think that you're better at being a friend than other folks are better than being a friend? No, no, no. What I'm asking is, are you a better friend to your friends than she is to her friends? And she is to her friends, and he is to his friends. Oh, but people estimate things like that all the time. People estimate how smart they think they are relative to other people, how athletic they are relative to other people. People make sense of these things all the time and have no problem answering. And maybe that particular one is difficult for you to answer, but what I can tell you is, Hundreds of thousands of people have answered questions like this, and they always do exactly what all of you just did. They always do the same thing. Typically what you get is 75, 80% of people thinking they're better than 75 or 80% of people on almost any characteristic you can pick, whether it's friendliness, generosity, intelligence, health, happiness, likelihood to make money in their lifetimes, how long they will live. Okay. People overestimate again and again and again the likelihood that they are better on some dimension than most other people. Okay. It's one of the most replicated findings in all of psychology. You can do it with any group you want to. And if you get them to answer alone without watching what everyone else is doing, which is how we typically do our research, right? We bring someone into a testing room so they can't watch what everyone else is doing. That's why I had you close your eyes. Okay? You always get the same effect. Okay? Everyone thinks that on most dimensions, not everyone, most people think on most dimensions they're better than average. So Garrison Keillor uh, had a radio show for years and years called Lake Wobegon, and he used to refer to Lake Wobegon as the place where everyone is better than average, which, of course, is a statistical impossibility, but if you're making up a radio show about a place that doesn't exist, you can make up things like that and have them be true for that imaginary made-up place. The problem is, is that it also seems to be true for this non-imaginary place, and it's true no matter sort of how you constrain who you're comparing yourselves to as well. You might say, well, it's not fair to compare yourself to everyone. It doesn't matter if you say everyone in the world, everyone in the United States, everyone who's the same age as you, everyone who's a student at UCLA. You typically get these same effects over and over and over again. And Shelley Taylor, who's um, a professor at UCLA, a very, very distinguished professor at UCLA, uh, referred to these as positive illusions that we hold about ourselves. In the 1980s, she wrote a paper on positive illusions. And she actually suggested that having these positive illusions okay, are actually very healthy for you. They have all sorts of mental and physical health benefits, having these positive illusions. And others have debated whether that's really the case, whether it's a good thing to be positively deluded about yourself or whether it's a bad thing. Um, and it's, it's an ongoing debate. Uh, but what's not in debate is that typical folks, like all of us, tend to think we're better than average. And the only group that reliably is accurate about where they fall on different dimensions are people diagnosed with depression. Okay? Depressed folks are quite accurate in assessing where they fall on various dimensions. And so this is a big piece of the evidence, um, is, is that 
people who are mentally healthy, who are not diagnosed with depression, are less accurate about themselves. They have more of these positive illusions and more extreme positive illusions than individuals who are uh, depressed, clinically depressed. Okay? What I want to okay, think about here, okay, okay, we know this from lots of things we've already talked about, but we know most people don't realize that they're biased in this way, right? So I can tell you this lecture and I can ask you, you know, who out there is biased, right? And you'll all think, oh yeah, no, I get it. Lots of people are biased. But I was accurate when I raised my hand, right? I was the accurate one. And of course, some of you are, right? Somebody is the best friend to their friends. And they're probably going to raise their hands and say, I'm the best friend to my friends, Okay? So it's not that everyone who had their hands raised is inaccurate. The point of that demonstration is that some of you who had your hands raised were inaccurate and none of you think you're that person. You think you're that person? Sure. Yeah, but we all care about who's good friends to their friends, right? Don't you want to have friends that are good friends to you? Right? So we all take these things that are relatively subjective and we have ways of sort of saying, okay, this is what matters. And we're going to come back to your point in a few minutes. Your point's a valid one and we'll come back to it in a few minutes. Uh, it's on a slide in maybe two slides. So if I haven't addressed what you've said then, raise your hand again. Okay. All right. So... Most people are biased. Most people don't know they're biased. Okay, that sounds like hypothesis three. We don't know what we don't know. And so what I want to ask you is why is it okay, that people might give these biased, positive answers about themselves? Why is it that most people think they're better at most things most of the time. Okay? And there's not one answer. There's actually probably six or seven different answers here. Um, but I want to get your feedback from why you think it is that most people might be mistaken about this. Yeah? It gives you a sense of confidence. So it makes you feel better about yourself to think that you're better than other folks about whatever it is that you're thinking about. Yep, that's a good one. What else? Elevator logic. You have your standard of what you think being a good friend means, mm -hmm. and therefore you apply that standard to your behavior, and other people don't have the same standard you do. Right. So this is a similar point to the one that was made back there, and this is a great answer. This is one of the big reasons why we show these positive illusions, and I'll come back to that. But there's a bunch of others. Why else? We don't want to think of ourselves as bad people. We don't want to think of ourselves as bad people, right? Why would it matter if you thought of yourself as a bad person or a good person? You are the person you are, right? And yet it matters to us whether or not we think we're good or bad. That's a strange thing. So it's less about just sort of being who you are and knowing who you are and more about not wanting to feel bad because you might know something negative about yourself. Okay. What else? We certainly want to be better. The question is, why and why do we delude ourselves into thinking we are better? And remember, people don't just delude themselves and know they're deluding themselves. They don't just say, I'm going to say I'm 20 points smarter than I am just because that's what I want to say. They actually believe it when they say it. So the question is, how do we end up believing these things? Yeah. Uh, well, a self-fulfilling prophecy would mean it was true. Unless you're saying you're trying to set up a self-fulfilling prophecy and make it come true. Um, and I think that's a reasonable account, if, if that's what you're pointing to. Is that if I don't set high expectations for myself, how am I going to get there? Right? Yeah. So we're evaluating information that's hard to assess because we don't know all those people. Okay? But now here's the interesting thing. Think about your friends. Think about your friends and think about five of your friends and how smart you think they are relative to everyone else. Okay? 
we don't have any problem thinking we can do that pretty precisely. Right? We know which of the five is the most smart. We know which of the five is probably the least smart. Or pick whatever, athletics. It doesn't have to be intelligence. And we have a sense of where they fall relative to the whole distribution of people. Um, what about anything darker? Nobody reads Freud anymore? I mean, I don't like Freud personally, although I am vaguely related to him. Uh, but vaguely, like my family married into his family at some point. Um, so I don't have his blood. I'm okay with that. Oh, that's good. I hadn't thought of that one before. And I asked the question a little differently this time than I do, but I had you thinking about you and your friends, which might put you in a positive mood. And when you're in a positive mood, you might make more positive estimates. You're sort of priming a positivity response. I think that's a really great answer. Um, now, I could do this in such a way that I didn't prime that, and you'd still get the effect. But given the way I actually did it, I think that's a, that's a really, really nice answer. Um, so Freud basically said you have these little demons running around in your head, and they're your unconscious, and they're trying to protect you from knowing the dark truth about yourself. Right? So there's lots of things that a lot of people think our unconscious prevents us from knowing about ourselves because it would be too painful. So it's not just about our conscious desire to see ourselves positively, but it's about this sort of inborn, sort of unconscious demon we have that's always sort of shielding us from knowing the, the nasty truths about ourselves. Okay. There's also other issues. See, you folks are mostly focusing on what went on at the moment that I asked you the question. Okay. But a lot of the answer has to do with what happened in the years of your life leading up to that moment. See, one of the reasons you might think you're better at things than sort of statistical data would actually suggest you are is because we don't, as a society, give a whole lot of negative feedback to people. So when you were little, if you're like most kids in most families, your parents and grandparents spent a lot of time telling you how awesome you were in every dimension imaginable. How cute you were, how intelligent you were, um, how funny you were, how athletic you were. It's going to be a little bit different for each kid. But parents tend to give a lot of effusive feedback. And more and more, teachers are kind of restricted from giving negative feedback. There was this big movement that we'll come back to at the end of lecture about enhancing self-esteem, right? So there's the thing where, you know, if you play like Little League or T-ball, like every player on every team gets a trophy, right? Like, look, it's the loser's trophy. Awesome. Because we don't want anyone to actually feel bad about not having... Uh, achieved, But part of the consequence of never giving negative feedback is that people don't have accurate feedback. Okay. So there's a bunch of different explanations. Okay. Um, we have more insights into our own attempts to be a good friend. That's another one. So we can very vividly imagine the things we've done to be a good friend but it's harder to imagine what the random masses ever did that was nice to their friends. Okay. This last one here, though, is the one that was actually brought up first. And actually, that one almost never gets brought up by the class. So I think that was particularly nice that that got brought up. But one of the sort of tricks of this is that each of you defined for yourself what it means to be a good friend. Okay, So... Okay, um, what are the different definitions we might give of being a good friend? Raise your hand and let me know what's the most important quality someone can have to be a good friend. Loyal. Loyal. What else? Loyal, honesty. Trust. What? Trust. Trust. Acceptance. Acceptance. Compassion. Compassion. What else? Yeah, having fun together is never one of the first five things people list for being a good friend. Every time I do this, I'm always amazed that people sort of say all these really serious, like, they must be loyal, they must always be at my side. 
And like, no one ever says like, fun drinking buddy. Like, that's always like number nine on the list of things that people come up with. Do they have a truck? Will they help you move? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, right? So there's all these different things that we care about. Make me laugh. Fun to go out with. Good wingman at a club, right? I mean, whatever it is, right? There's all these different things that we care about. But the critical thing is, whichever one you thought of when I asked you what's your most important dimension, you have that quality in spades. That's the thing, is that each of you probably generated an answer for what's the most important quality for a friend to have that you have. So the game is already up. Because if you define what makes a good friend in terms of the specific quality that you have that you're using to define friendship, you probably are better than most people on that specific dimension. Right? If you remember back to the study by Tom Gilovich on the 60s and 80s music, where the two people sort of said they disagreed. One said they liked 60s music, one said they liked 80s music, but really they were talking about different bands. And if you got them to actually agree on what bands were representing the 60s and the 80s, they tended to agree. This is a very similar phenomenon. Here, you've got people defining what friendship is in different ways. Okay. And they're probably each mostly right that they are better than most people on that particular dimension. Because that's the thing that they themselves emphasize. And so the person who values loyalty is loyal. And the person that values fun is fun. And what we don't think about is all those other definitions that other people might be applying. So this is a case where in terms of what you're specifically thinking of, you're probably right. But when you generalize that to saying, well, this is what defines being a good friend in general, well, now you're all using different definitions. And if we all sort of came up with an agreed upon definition, then it's harder to sort of run that trick and, and have it work. People will still say they're better than average even if you give people a very specific set of definitions, but the effect is, is attenuated. Now, David Dunning is a professor at Cornell who does really amazing research, um, and he did these studies on this sort of uh, defining of the comparison standard, defining what dimension is relevant and important. What he did in these studies is he would have people come in and he would have them list, you know, what is most important in a friend. He would do it with lots of different things, but let's just stick with that example. So he would have everyone list, you know, kind of what are the five most important characteristics in a friend from most important to next most important to next most important. So you'd get these five things. And then he would have them fill out some personality questionnaires and he would give them fake feedback about themselves. And for some people, he gave them feedback that the fifth most important characteristic was something that they weren't very good at themselves. But for some people, he gave them feedback saying their most important characteristic was something they weren't very good at themselves. So some people who said loyalty is really important in that intake questionnaire, when they got their feedback based on the personality data, they said, well, the psychologists have reviewed your personality data, and one of the things they've noticed is that you're probably not a very loyal person. Okay? I don't think they did it quite so bluntly, but that was essentially what they did. Here's the interesting thing. They then asked them again in the next testing period, okay, list the things that are really important in being a good friend. Okay? If your first thing was something that you had been told you weren't very good at, they now didn't list that as the most important characteristic in being a friend. Now they listed something else that they were told they were good at. Okay, so there was this subtle movement in how they defined what being a good friend is as a function of what they currently believed they were good at. So you could get a person to change their definition on the fly by changing what they were told they themselves were good at. I just think that's brilliant. I wish I had done that study, but I never would have come up with a study like that, but I think it's really, really cool um, and really uh, illuminating about how we work. Yeah? 
Oh, the second, the only condition that really matters is, is that he told people, so there's the condition I told you about that matters and another condition that I didn't tell you about that also matters that I should have mentioned. So the one I told you about that matters is when people were told that the thing they had listed as their most important characteristic, they were told they're bad at that. And then there were other people who were told they were really good at something that they listed lower. And the people who were told they were really good at something they listed lower moved up the importance of that characteristic later on. There's a guy who's sort of been circling around, checking out the classroom. He came, stood back there, and then he was just looking in from over here. He's welcome, but I don't know what's going on. All right, so I want to talk about um, some empirical research on what are referred to as self-serving biases, and positive illusions are all self-serving biases. So a self-serving bias is essentially some cognition, some way of thinking or seeing the world that benefits you to see it a certain way. So one of the classic early self-serving biases, and, and back then they were also referred to as egocentric biases, was done uh, by Ross and Sicoli. This is not Lee Ross, the one I've talked about a lot in here. This is Michael Ross. And up until last year, I assumed Michael and Lee Ross were brothers, but it turns out no relation whatsoever. Um, so really different Ross altogether. Uh, and in this study, they had couples come in, okay, and they rated sort of what percentage responsibility they and their partners each took for 20 different sort of household tasks. Taking out the trash, doing the dishes, all the different things that you might have to take care of. Sweeping, okay? What percentage of the work do you do? What percentage of the work does your partner do on each of these 20 tasks? And what they found is that on average, subjects thought they were more responsible for handling 16 of the 20 tasks which of course is impossible. If one of them said 16 accurately, the other one would have to say 4 to be accurate. And then that would average out to 10. So the average should be 10 if nobody is biased. And they don't have to figure out in this study who's telling the truth. It's just not possible for on average each person in the pair to be respons more responsible for 16 of the 20 chores. And so, the other thing, okay, so there's sort of a couple of different ways that you can understand why this might have happened. Why do you get this kind of effect? There are both cognitive explanations and motivational explanations. And for years, this was a huge debate within social psychology. Whether or not these kinds of biases, these positive illusions, these self-serving biases, are they the result of just the way our mind processes information? Or is it something about the way that we're motivated to see ourselves more positively? So the motivational side is easy to see. Okay? I want to think that I'm a responsible member of the pair, and so I feel better about myself if I can tell myself that I'm responsible for 16 of the 20. Right? I'm a better person if I'm that person. So you can see why people might be motivated to have this position. The other side is a little harder to see, and this is the, the cognitive side, the informational side. Uh, and one of the explanations they gave in this particular paper was that people were better able at remembering their own behavior than their partner's behavior. See, let's say you mentally go inside your head and you say, okay, I'm going to think of all the times uh, that I've seen myself do these chores, and I'm going to think of all the times I've seen my partner do these chores. And that might seem like a legitimate kind of scientific way to approach the question. The problem is, is that you're always there watching yourself when you do the chores, and you're not always there when your partner is doing the chores. So you have a different database of information for yourself than you do for your partner. Okay? So if you just go through and honestly as you can, think of all the times that you've seen yourself do chores, and all the time that you've seen your partners do chores, you're going to come up with a biased answer that makes you look better. And you can do that with no motivation to see yourself in a positive light. It, it's just the fact of how you sought out the information 
in what wasn't really a fair database to be considering, your memory for you versus your partner. Okay? So this would be a purely cognitive account that doesn't require us thinking that a person wants to see themselves in a positive light. And I think this is very important. This is striking. The fact that something that looks clearly and purely motivational could be the result of just the way our information processing in our mind works was a very powerful statement. A hard pill to swallow, I think, but a very powerful statement in the early 80s and kind of throughout the 80s. Um, so... Sure. So the, the statement was, isn't this like the introspection error, introspective thinking error? And it certainly is, right? This is another example where what people went to sort of look for in their own mind wasn't the right stuff because what's easily accessible, just like in the Tim Wilson study, it was easier to put certain things into words than others. It's easier to retrieve memories about yourself than someone else, but that might not occur to you when you go use this strategy. You might just think, well, let me try to remember what I've seen of each. That seems fair. Um, it just turns out that it's accidentally not fair. Now, I don't want to suggest that phenomena like these are only cognitive, but at the time, coming on the heels of you know, Freud being a big deal for most of the 20th century, it was a really big deal to say, you know, the more humans work like computers, and that was kind of the, the new metaphor that was coming in the 70s, was that the human mind is like a computer, and that has its own problems. But that metaphor, for a while, led people to think, well, then we're just going to be really good at doing things because computers are accurate and precise. Okay? But computers are accurate and precise at carrying out the instructions they have on the information that they have access to. And that information can be flawed, it can be inappropriate. And so you can have a system that has no motivational bias that produces biased outputs. So that was a pretty big deal. At the same time, there is really strong evidence for motivational components to phenomena like these. So for instance, if I make you fail at a task, and I'm not going to show you a study on this, but I'll, I'll just mention it in passing. If I make you fail at a task, you will show a bigger overestimate here than if I don't make you fail at a task. Why? Because you're trying to make yourself feel better at some level. So it, you can't explain that one in the cognitive terms so easily. But I want to show you a study that is also motivational, that's a sort of newer, flashier study that really can't be explained cognitively as far as I can tell. So this is a study that uh, Nick Epley did. Um, and Nick Epley is at University of Chicago Business School, and he was a student of David Dunning, who did the Standard of Comparison stuff, and Tom Gilovich, who did the 60s and 80s music stuff. Oh, it all goes together. Okay. In this study, each subject had a picture of them taken, and that's this picture here in the middle. And that picture was morphed together with what was decided to be an attractive and unattractive face. Okay? And so your picture as a subject gets morphed, so your actual picture is here in the middle, and then here is a picture with you and 10% of the more attractive person, 20%, so on, up to 50%. And then they do the same thing in the other direction. And the, the study is incredibly simple. You're presented with these faces in some random configuration, okay? and you're asked to pick which one is actually you. Which one is your actual face? Okay. And what they find is that on average, this is their actual picture. And you get some people picking that. But look, you get almost no one picking over here where you're morphed at all with the negative face. And lots of people pick faces that are morphed in with the more attractive face. Okay, so these people are literally just saying, that's me, and it's not. It's them plus an attractive face morphed in. Okay, and we giggle at this, but those people are you. <laughs> yep, that's funny too. Um, okay, so I want to spend some more time talking about kind of the motivational side of self-processing. Okay? And specifically, kind of the major topic for today's lecture is self-esteem, which is 
sort of the most fundamental motivational aspect of the self. How much do we like ourselves? Okay. Self-esteem literally means esteem for the self, and esteem literally means to regard with respect. So it's how much do you like yourself, how much do you respect yourself, and if you ever take a self-esteem questionnaire, these are exactly the kinds of questions you get. How much do you value yourself? Okay, this is bizarre. It's bizarre that we have an opinion about ourselves. First of all, we're the last person who should be, you know, asked to generate an opinion of our own worth. Right? That's like, you know, going to a player on any team and saying, you know, how good is your team? And taking that as like a meaningful estimate of anything other than just what the player wants to say or hopes is true or hopes is true someday. Right? It's like going to all the investment banks and saying, how good of a bank are you? Right? We don't trust them to answer for themselves. We want somebody else to go in there and do the assessment. Okay? But we focus a lot on our own self-esteem. We are motivated to have high self-esteem. We're motivated to like ourselves. Which is weird. Right? That's weird. We're not necessarily motivated to be a good person. We're motivated to think we're a good person. Those are not the same thing. Bad people typically think they're good people. So we're built to make sure we think we're good people. And of course, if you're built that way, then it's easy for there to be all sorts of biases that creep in motivationally to make us think we're good people. If what's important is to think you're good rather than to be good, well, that's a lot easier. Right? Being good, that's hard. That takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, all the time. Thinking I'm good, I just have to trick myself once. I'm done. I'm good. I think that there are a lot of people who have low self-esteem. Really? Yeah, see, actually very few people have low self-esteem. So there's two ways to think about low self-esteem. One is, here's everybody. So here's the people who have high self-esteem. Here's the people who are on the low end of the spectrum. Now, on any variable, you're going to get a distribution of people across the variable, and there's going to be people on the high end and the low end. So, of course, we can say, if we split it right at the middle, we could say half the people have high self-esteem and half the people have low self-esteem. So we could do that, and we can define that any way we want. That doesn't actually get us very far. But if instead we say, take a one-item uh, self-esteem measure. How much do you like yourself? Okay, one item scored from one to seven. People who have high self-esteem will typically give themselves a six or a seven on that item. People who have low self-esteem will give themselves a four or a five. Almost no one says one, two, three. So if we think about it in some objective sense, almost everyone says I'm at the midpoint or higher in terms of how much I like myself. So in terms of that, if we're not talking about individuals who are clinically depressed, if we're talking about sort of the normal distribution, if we're talking about this group of 300 people, 95% of the people in here would give themselves a four or higher, and I would guess 85% would give themselves a five or higher. We're built that way for one reason or another. Now there's questions, I, I should be cautious in my use of built, because there are debates about how culturally universal this is. Um, and I think the evidence currently comes down on the side that it is culturally universal, but the form that it takes is different. So in America, we say, I'm great. And in Europe, I'm sorry, in East Asian countries, there's a greater tendency to say, I'm a part of great groups. Right? So I don't have to say anything about myself. I just say, I'm a part of great groups. But if you're a part of great groups, and groups are sort of the, the unit of analysis that your culture values... That's kind of like saying, hey, I'm great. I got into the great groups. So there's different manifestations of this sort of need for positive self-regard. But, but that's, still, that's still out there being debated. Okay, there was another question over here. Same, okay. No? Okay. Um, so, we know that people want to have high self-esteem. I think objectively speaking, we can say that most people have high self-esteem. And whenever I talk about low self-esteem for the rest of lecture, I'm referring to those people who give themselves fours and fives on a seven-point scale. I'm going to call those folks 
low self-esteem for the rest of the time I talk about self-esteem, but just remember, they're not really low. They're, they're more like middle self-esteem. There's high and middle self-esteem for almost everyone. So we can ask ourselves, well, what does self-esteem do for us that we work so hard to get it? Right? We work really hard to see ourselves in a positive light, harder than we work to be good people, I think, in a lot of um, cases. So what does self-esteem do for us? Um, any thoughts on, on why it's worth having self-esteem and, and what it gets you if you have it? What's that? So people respect you more if you have high self-esteem. I think that's right. So what do you mean by that? Like why? So, you know, like the, the woman sitting next to you, if she has high self-esteem, why do you respect her more? What's that? Can you? Okay, so, you know, there, we think, well, if somebody doesn't think positively of themselves, why should I think positively of them? Uh, we want to be liked. Right, so, so this is one of these cases where self-esteem may turn out to be a very paradoxical, unexpected, psychological phenomenon. Okay, so Mark Leary um, is at Duke University, and he was actually Tim Duncan's teacher when he was at Wake Forest. They published a paper together, and whenever Tim Duncan is in whatever town, Tim Leary, sorry, not Tim Leary, now I've just lost it, Mark Leary. Um, Tim Leary, they'd be doing other things. Um, Mark Leary is in. Mark Leary gets courtside seats for Spurs games. Um, only NBA player to ever publish a social psychology paper. Anyway, so Mark Leary had this amazing hypothesis. I think it's amazing. It's very counterintuitive, but I think it's probably right. And he called this hypothesis the sociometer hypothesis of self-esteem. Okay. And the sociometer hypothesis refers back to the last couple lectures. He said, essentially, we carry around other, uh, we carry around society standards, the generalized other. So if we meet those standards, it means that we're probably going to be accepted by those other people in society. Okay. In other words, my self-esteem reflects whether I'm matching the standards of the generalized other. And my self-esteem, therefore, is a proxy for how much I think I will be liked, accepted, and valued by other people in society. And so it's actually a measure not just of what I think of myself, but my best estimate of what I think other people are going to think of me. It's a predictor of whether or not we think we're likable to others, not just to ourselves. Now, what's so striking about this hypothesis is this is not what almost anyone thinks of when they think of self-esteem. We don't think the reason we want self-esteem is because it's an estimate of how much other people like us. We really think it's a personal thing just about how much I like myself, and I want to like myself more. But why would it matter if I liked myself more if that was the end in itself? If it's telling us how much we're liked and accepted by others, well, geez, then it's really important. Because being liked and accepted by others determines whether or not you're going to get picked last for the game or you're going to get picked last to eat the food that the tribe bought, brought back for today and maybe you won't get to eat it all tonight. I'm thinking 10, 20,000 years ago, not this week. Um, right? But when we evolved, knowing that you were accepted and valued by the rest of the group, by the tribe, was hugely determinative of how good your life was going to be. And so self-esteem, if you have a generalized other... Self-esteem is a way of assessing whether you're doing the kinds of things relative to that generalized other to get you to be liked and valued by others. Because it's hard to know what others actually think a lot of the time. And so this, maybe, gets used as a proxy for that. Now the data that speaks to this hypothesis is really complicated and it's not 
the same kind of straightforward data that I try to show you. So I'm not going to show you the data. I think the data does a reasonably good job of establishing the sociometer hypothesis as at least part of the story of what self-esteem is. And if you're interested in that, I can point you to the papers, or you could just go look up Mark Leary. Uh, but I think that's a really compelling idea, and I think that the data that I'm not going to show you is at least reasonably convincing that that's what's going on. Um, another idea that's sort of a more personally focused idea for self-esteem is that self-esteem helps us cope. Okay? That when we fail at something, maybe we sort of think about ourselves and think, am I a failing kind of person or is this an aberration? Should I get up off the floor and keep going because I know I can do better than this? Or, yeah, is that just me? I don't do that well at things, so you know this kind of makes sense. And so your estimate of sort of how much you like yourself, how much you think you are sort of good and good at things in general can help you persist in the face of failure and recover from negative events. Okay, so I'm going to show you a, a number of studies that speak to, to some of these kinds of issues. So this uh, first study is a study that was done by Jonathan Brown, who got his PhD here with Shelley Taylor. Um, and in this study, and lots of studies that I'm going to show you, People come in and they get some kind of feedback. Either they're told something positive about themselves or something negative. They are given some kind of test, like an anagrams test, which is rigged for them to either succeed or fail. For these studies, it doesn't matter. All that matters is there's kind of a threat condition where you're told something negative about yourself or that you did poorly. And then there's usually some control condition, which is either neutral or positive. You succeeded. Okay. And then low SE is low self-esteem, high SE is high self-esteem. That'll be on lots of these figures that I'm going to show you. And what you see here is when people get positive feedback, they told they succeeded at an anagrams test, it makes them about the same level happy regardless of whether they're high or low self-esteem. And this is a generally true thing. Self-esteem does not affect how people feel when they get positive feedback. They feel about the same. Everyone likes getting positive feedback. But when they get negative feedback, this is where you see divergence between the two groups. Okay? So everyone feels a bit worse when they get negative feedback, but the low self-esteem folks show a much bigger drop in happiness than the high self-esteem folks. The high self-esteem folks either seem better at kind of maintaining their positive feelings or maybe at restoring them quickly. We don't know. We can't tell from this because this measure came a few minutes after they were given the negative feedback. Mm -hmm. so would self-esteem be, like self be like a buffer? That's definitely the hypothesis here. It, and it's one of multiple hypotheses, but the idea is, is that high self-esteem may buffer you against negative events, where you might just say, well, that's just one thing, but I know I'm good in general. So why should I be so concerned about sort of this one thing that happened? That's just one thing. That, that's a drop in the bucket. Okay. Um, so that's one possible answer to why do high self-esteem folks feel better than low self-esteem folks after failure. HSE is high self-esteem. Um, we can look pretty cognitively at what's going on immediately after success and failure. So there was a study done uh, by Dodgson and Wood where they gave people positive or negative feedback. Um, and immediately after they got positive or negative feedback. They either failed at something or they didn't fail at something. They were given a reaction time task where they were shown words related to their own strengths and weaknesses. And they had to see how quickly they could recognize those. So the idea is, this gets back to the idea of accessibility. The closer something is to that line for consciousness, the faster you can respond to that thing when you see it out in the world, because it's already close to consciousness for you. 
Okay? So you'll recognize the word Juliet faster if I've just said Romeo compared to if I haven't just said Romeo. So if you've got something primed in your mind, you can recognize it faster out in the world. And what they found, okay, what we have are in kind of the bright green bars are the condition where they didn't fail at something before they did the reaction time test. And in the sort of clay green bars, you have uh, the conditions where they failed. And these are all low self-esteem folks. So the interesting thing here is that people are slower to recognize their weaknesses if they're low self-esteem folks when they haven't just failed at something compared to when they have. So lower bars are faster because this is reaction time. So the faster you do it, the lower your bar. And when low self-esteem folks fail at something, they get faster at recognizing their weaknesses. What that means is their weaknesses become salient for them after failure. Okay? And that's not too surprising. Right? This is kind of what you would expect to see happening in general. The thing is, it's not what happens for high self-esteem folks. So for high self-esteem folks, right after they fail, seconds after they fail, their weaknesses get less accessible to them. They get pushed out of consciousness. They get pushed further away from consciousness. And instead, what becomes more accessible? Their strengths. Okay, so words related to their strengths, they now respond to faster than before they failed. Okay, so failure makes them faster at thinking about their strengths. So what is coming to mind, not necessarily consciously, just in a primed accessibility sort of way, what's coming to mind is different for the high and low self-esteem folks after failure. Failure makes low self-esteem folks more primed for their negative attributes. And of course, if that's what's primed in your mind, that might help maintain that negative mood. Right? Because if that's what you think of easily, that's not going to help you get out of the mood. But if you have high self-esteem, okay, having your strengths come to mind when you fail may help buffer you and get you back into a more positive frame of mind. Yeah. Oh, I don't know that it's necessarily cognitive dissonance here. All this means is, look, if you failed at one thing, that may or may not be relevant to saying how you are in general. Like, we can all say objectively, who cares about failing on an anagrams test? What does that say about me? Well, when someone with low self-esteem fails on an anagrams test, their general weaknesses come to mind more. When someone with high self-esteem fails on an anagrams test, their general strengths come to mind more. So I don't think it's a dissonance phenomenon so much as just these folks are kind of built. And I, and I really do think in this case we're talking about how they're built. And built means DNA and your social life up until that point. But they change the wiring in you such that certain things come to mind more easily after failure. And it's different for these two folks. How does, are you wanting to? <laughs> so how do I go about becoming one of these low self-esteem folks? Um, I don't know that they do. I, I don't know that high self-esteem folks typically do become low self-esteem folks. You're, so things like your self-esteem, uh, this is, uh, this is, oh, should I tell you this? Yeah, it's kind of disturbing. I, I heard this when I was 25 and it really kind of upset me. Um, oh. What does that mean? I was 25 like 40 years ago. It doesn't mean anything to you. They didn't even have color TV when I was 25. So your personality, your self-esteem measured at age 27 is almost a perfect predictor of your personality and self-esteem at age 81. Okay, there have been studies done, longitudinal studies done, which the, the wrong take-home message that we took home when we found this out when we were 25 is like, we've got two years to fix ourselves. That's not really the message. It's probably fixed. But the idea is it's not as fixed when you're 15 as when you're 27. When you're 27, you're pretty far into the social world that you're probably going to live in for most of the rest of your life. Um, so I don't think you get many cases of people with very high self-esteem becoming folks with very low self-esteem. Any other questions on this? Okay, so these are the conclusions from that study. Um, and I've gone through these. Failure for high self-esteem folks makes their strengths more accessible, their weaknesses more remote, 
And this may aid in recovery. It might buffer you against the negativity of what you've just found out about failing at something. And it may prevent rumination because your mind tends towards the positive rather than the negative. Folks with low self-esteem, their mind tends towards negative attributes of themselves, which may promote rumination, which may keep them in a more negative mood. Now, I've sort of addressed this already a bit, but I just want you to sort of think a little bit about kind of the correlational nature of what I'm showing you and the circularity of it. Okay? Is it that if you have high self-esteem, you feel better about yourself after failure than if you have low self-esteem? Or is it the case that if you're the kind of person who thinks better about yourself after failure, you're the kind of person who then says, I have self-esteem, high self-esteem? You could think about this in either way. And ultimately, I don't know that you can really tease them apart, but we tend to think that if you have self-esteem or if you just got someone to say they like themselves, that these benefits would accrue to them. But I don't know that that's true. My suspicion is, is that most people have cognitive biases like the ones shown in this Dodgson and Wood study, and it's because of these biases that we end up saying, I like myself more or less. If you're always in a good mood because you have cognitive mechanisms that support that, then when you think about yourself, you might say, I like myself more than someone who has cognitive mechanisms that tend to keep them more often in negative or neutral moods. Can you prime someone with low self-esteem to have higher self-esteem? I mean, I think that you can probably temporarily create some minor shifts. Um, I don't know if anyone has shown enduring changes. Um, and again, it's not clear whether you just get someone to like themselves more, whether you get all the benefits that support the natural liking of oneself more. Um, so it's a little bit, and this is sort of one of the, the last slides I have on here, but it's a little bit like saying, okay, I've got gas in the tank. And all these cognitive mechanisms are my gas in the tank that allow me to sort of navigate the world and feel good about myself, feel sort of like recover from negative events and things like that. But then in the car itself, I have the gas gauge that tells me how far my gas tank is, you know, towards empty or full. Okay? Self-esteem is kind of like the gas gauge. And having these mechanisms are maybe like the actual gas tank. And so the question is, if somebody goes in and just pushes the needle on the gas tank up to full, does that mean you're any more full? No, it doesn't work that way, right? So you can push the needle on the gas tank, you can trick the, the meter, but that doesn't mean you get any of the benefits of having a naturally occurring full tank. So I think that's kind of the, one of the issues that comes up. And, and this really comes up because of issues related to education, and whether or not we should be trying to sort of take our kids and push their gas meter up to the top of the charts. And it depends on what you think self-esteem does and, and how it works. But we'll come back to that. Um, here's another sort of similar study. In this study, uh, people were made to succeed or fail, say at an anagrams test, and then they were asked, um, would you like to watch this? So you have to watch a video for the next portion of the study. Okay. Would you like to watch this funny comedy video or do you want to watch you know, some neutral, uh, non-funny, non-interesting video? And what you see is that high self-esteem folks seem to appreciate that after failure, something that's funny and especially distracting is something that will help restore their mood. So high self-esteem folks say, give me the funny video, especially if I've just failed at something. And low self-esteem folks say, I do not want that funny video if I'm in a bad mood. Okay. They say, nope, I'm good. I'm going to stay in this negative mood right now and don't give me anything that might get me out of it. Okay, so here is sort of this low-level choice. Here's another low-level choice that I think seems to have very similar effects. So people were given an opportunity to volunteer and help someone else after they succeeded or failed at something. And you see the same pattern here. Folks with high self-esteem seem to at least implicitly know that helping someone else is one of the best ways to make yourself feel better. Helping someone else makes you feel good. People with high self-esteem increase their volunteering rate when they fail, when they're in need of a boost. Folks with low self-esteem are less likely 
to help someone else when they're in a negative mood. Okay. So, folks with high self-esteem have more favorable self-views, and they seem to be better at maintaining and restoring these favorable self-views. Okay. After failure, more positive thoughts, self-thoughts, are salient for them. They persist more in the face of failure. I don't think I actually showed you the slide on that that I used to show. They're more motivated to restore their mood and more willing to help. Okay. So, apart from the question of why did this happen, because <laughs> that's not what it looked like on my computer before class, but that says underneath it, if you could actually read what it says there, it says, is high self-esteem always a good thing? Okay. And one reason it might not be is because it creates a high standard to be maintained. If you have high self-esteem, then you think you're the kind of person that good things should always be happening to, who should be always winning, who should always be succeeding at things. If you have low expectations of yourself, when you don't succeed, it's less of a shock to the system. Um, so, Roy Baumeister, Todd Heatherton have done a series of studies where they've looked at sort of the dark side of high self-esteem. Okay. This is the same Roy Baumeister with the historical theory of the self, but in his purely uh, scientific uh, persona. So what he did, similar to the other studies I've shown you, uh, he threatens some people, so he makes them fail, he tells them they're bad at something, or just neutral, no threat, no failure. High and low self-esteem and then after this, he gives them an opportunity to play this gambling game. And the gambling game kind of has a risky and non-risky strategy that you can play on any trial. Okay? I mean, there's always risk involved, but there's a riskier and a less risky strategy. And what he looks at is essentially how much money they win. I think they're playing with like nickels or something like that. And this is like someone winning $2.80 at the end of like the five minute gambling period. And so what he finds, the critical thing on here, is that folks with high self-esteem who have just had their ego threatened lose all their money. Okay? Threatened high self-esteem folks are not the people you should be betting your money on when they're betting. Because okay? they bet all their money away. And strangely, and I don't think they have a great story for this, low self-esteem folks make a ton of money when they have been ego threatened. Okay? Any guesses as to why... The high self-esteem folks end up down here. Well, they have more to lose in the back. So their self-esteem is inflated, and what does that do in terms of the gambling? So I think what happens here okay, is these folks with high self-esteem are hurting because they're so used to feeling good about themselves that being told something negative about themselves hurts more momentarily. And so what they're doing is they're scanning their environment for some way to make themselves feel better. Okay? We saw that they're willing to help someone more because that's one way to make yourself feel better. But another way to feel better is to win a lot of money at gambling. That's fun, right? You've been to Vegas. You've at least seen movies with people going to Vegas. It's fun to win a lot of money. And so what looks like the way to win the most money is to take the risky gambling strategy. Because if you win at the risky gambling strategy, you get more money. But of course, risky gambling strategies don't ever actually pay off. They lead to you losing all your money. So while you could win more money, you almost never do when you take risky strategies. So the high self-esteem folks say, put everything on 13, let it ride, and then they lose everything. Okay. The low self-esteem folks aren't feeling real good about themselves and they'll say, you know what, I'm just going to be conservative here. I'm not going to go crazy or anything. And they end up winning a whole lot. Here's another example, another reason why you don't want to be around a high self-esteem person necessarily right after they've had negative things happen to them. Um, so this is, uh, they, there's a variety of aggression games that are used by psychologists. And in this particular aggression game, what happens is you're in separate testing rooms, you and another subject. Okay? You're wearing headphones, and there's a button in front of you, 
And when you hear a sound, the two of you have to race to see who can hit the button first. Whoever hits the button first wins that round, and they get to administer kind of a loud noise blast into the other person's headphones. And you get to choose how long and how intense that noise blast is going to be. So they had folks who were threatened or praised, low or high self-esteem, and in general, nobody wants to actually give these loud, intense, long noise blasts, except for folks with high self-esteem who have just been threatened. Okay? And this seems to be a case where it's like, if I can make you suffer, relative to you, I'm doing better. So I'm willing to make you suffer to make myself feel better. Okay, that's what the folks with high self-esteem do when their ego is threatened. Okay? So, why isn't high self-esteem always good? There's more pride or ego to protect when threatened. Of course, we want to ask, does self-esteem lead to helping or hurting others? We've seen both. High self-esteem folks will do both. And what it seems to really depend on is which opportunities are available to them at that moment to raise their self-esteem. Okay, so high self-esteem folks will help hurt or just watch a funny movie, whatever it is that's available to help them restore their mood. Okay. So, should we be trying to increase people's self-esteem? Well, we've already talked about the fact that a lot of this is correlational. So we don't really know what direction the causal effects go in. Self-esteem may be the gas gauge, not the gas tank. And so you shouldn't be messing with the gas gauge if what you really care about is the gas tank. Essentially, this is saying I want to increase my self-esteem without trying to be more esteemable. Right? If you want to have higher self-esteem, be more esteemable. But these are not the same thing. We know people who are very esteemable that we think are amazing, who have low self-esteem, and people who haven't done anything to warrant being esteemed by others who have very high self-esteem. So this is important because in the 1980s, there was a government-led task force on increasing self-esteem. And there were all these politicians who said, we've got it. Okay? If we can increase self-esteem in our children, it will improve our education, crime rate, drug abuse, teen pregnancy. It will make all these problems of society go away. Okay? But you should know, and this is important, all the best data that has been garnered in the last 20-something years to assess whether improving someone's self-esteem actually leads to any benefits, it doesn't. Okay? There is no effect that's been determined when you do the studies, I think, the right way, which are complex studies to run, there's no long-term observable effect, which suggests that when you change self-esteem, okay, you're fudging the gas gauge. You're not filling the tank. And so, how do you fill the tank? That's a, that's a whole separate hard question. But if we're focusing our efforts on messing with the gas gauge, that's not really going to get us anywhere. All right. That's it. How about that? I didn't think we'd finish that lecture.